Hello, and a continued happy pride to all. Welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 136, Board Game Tournament. Sharing our favorite board game tournament format. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. At least normally when we don't get messed over by Twitch not working. And tonight we are coming to you live on a Thursday night instead. Also, watch for our new show on Sundays, but more about that later. All right, tonight we have a question from one of our fantastic Patreon patrons who's looking for a board game tournament format specifically to use with their regular game group that gets together all the time. Now, following that, we've got a couple looks at uh, previews, stuff that's not quite released and not quite finished yet. Up first, we're going to bring back the Bellhops Digital Tabletop with an early look at Blood Bowl 3, followed by my thoughts on a prototype copy of Battle of Gog. This is a biblically-themed abstract war game. Finally, in our week of review, we've got some gameplays. Um, with uh, We had a gameplay with one of our patron pat Patreon patrons, and I finally got the new edition of World's Fair 1893 to the table and actually got to try that one out. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, we've got some folk who want to add to some of our game recommendation lists. Mm -hmm. First, we have Nick Welford, who commented on our best games for exactly five players to say, no Ponzi scheme? Shocked emoji, shocked emoji, shocked emoji. <laughs> Next, definitely a board game podcast had this to say about train games. Purely gut response, but I'd take out Brass and Colt Express. They don't feel like train games to me. Then, moving on to our next step train games from Ticket to Ride topic, Date Hate Me on Instagram notes, needs more Isle of Trains. <laughs> and finally, Francois Uldry left a comment on our Resistance is Futile episode, where we talk about our favorite tile laying games to note Alhambra is missing from that pile, I think. Well, thanks everyone for the game suggestions. Um, instead of addressing each of these, I'll just say, uh, as usual, we try to be as inclusive as possible on any of our recommendation lists, but there are two things that come up. One, there's no way we can play all the games. There's just too many out there. So there's gonna be games we haven't tried. And well, not every game is for everyone, which is why I love it. When other people step out, point out games they love that fit the category at hand. And I'm even fair with people telling us that we're wrong on some of them, which is just wrong for your group, which is totally fair. As usual, I'll toss a link to the new games in the show notes. Well, next up, a comment on our top 10 of the top 1000 list from a couple of weeks back. Kiko Arceo, Ar Arceo writes, my favorite top 10 category. So many great games that get deservedly shouted out that may not normally fit in other top 10s. Thanks, Kiko. And I got to agree. I, I actually had a lot more fun than I expected putting that list together. Uh, it was great to talk about some of the great games that get overlooked or overshadowed by the top 100s. It's something I think I want to do again, possibly in a year or so, because the board game geek, it fluctuates quite a bit. Now, what's in the whole top 10,000 or probably, sorry, not 10,000, 1,000, probably remain fairly stable with a bunch of new stuff thrown in but i have a feeling they'll move around a lot which will make it interesting now what i would love to do is find someone else's top 1000 list so i don't know what else is out there besides board game geek but i know people do publish other top lists if someone can point us to another top 1000 list to do this with i'd be willing to do it like more recently or sooner than going back to the board game geek list all right well next up two comments from adrian mann First, on our next step from Ticket to Ride article, they wrote, I love Ticket to Ride, and that's a great article. They also commented on our master list of tabletop uh, crafters on Etsy page to say, I really like Etsy, and I'm a firm advocate for supporting small, independent businesses and creatives. Thanks for sharing this. Well, thanks for the comments, Adrienne. Again, um, I do have to apologize for some of the jerks. Uh, we're family friendly here. I would use a much stronger word on MeWe, who took offense to her sharing some awesome-looking rainbow dice and wishing the LGBT plus members of our community a happy pride. There's no place for that kind of gaming, for that kind of behavior in the gaming community or in anything I will ever be involved in. All right, well, 
let's finish off with a longer comment about our Aventuria adventure card game review from last week. Ingolf Schaefer writes, I fully agree with your review. I had a lot of fun with the game as it plays very well. Some of the appeal is certainly lost to the international audience since the adventures are adapted versions of the classical dark modules from the 80s. Imagine that you would play the Keep on the Borderlands or Isle of Dread. Another thing seems to be a problem for Ulysses uh, US in general, proofreading. The typos, grammatical errors, misprints are also prevalent in Torg Eternity or the Ulysses version of Wrath and Glory. Well, thanks for the comments, Ingolf. Uh, so I, that's just cool. Like, so the adventures in Adventuria we've been playing, like trying to, uh, Saving Sylvana being one example, our, our old adventures brought back to life in a new format. That is really neat. I, I actually like that. That actually makes me dig the game even more. Um, as for proofreading, well, at least in Adventuria, there wasn't anything that broke the game in there, and we were able to figure out what was intended in all cases. I've definitely seen worse, but yeah, it definitely could have used another editor for another, another pair of eyes on that text before it went to print. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. One quick announcement before we move on to our main topic. We've got a new show on the Tabletop Bellhop Network. That's right. We're now live twice a week. Wednesdays, as always, but with a new unscripted show on Sundays. Uh, Sunday Brunch with the Bellhop is a new project we tried out last Sunday, and it went over actually really well, more better than I thought it would. So we decided to make it a regular thing. In this new, totally unscripted, low prep, low work for us show, we chat about whatever we feel like chatting about at that time. Though I'm sure this is mostly going to involve gaming gaming in some way. I don't plan to start talking about other topics all the time. Now, this looser format also gives us a great opportunity to interact with our lobbyists, the awesome folk who take part in the chat room here on Twitch. We want you to join in and tell us about your games and gaming experiences, too. It's still a show in its infancy, so times and names may change somewhat. But keep an eye on our socials, Sundays, and if you have the time, drop in, say hi, join the conversation, or just watch us chat. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a question from Tabletop Bellhop patron, Courtney Jackson, who asks, I have a small group of about 10 or 12 that game with us weekly. We are considering hosting a small board game tournament and are wondering, one, how to choose the game or games for the tournament. Mm -hmm. Two, how to draw so that the same people aren't sitting at the same table the whole time. Three, would it be better to do a league-style tournament where everyone meets weekly or bi-weekly and earns points over the course of several meets. Uh, first, thank you for the question, Courtney. While there are a number of different tournament formats out there uh, that all feature a mix of elimination, non-elimination, round robin, pyramid, or something about Swedish, I remember hearing about, trees, all of that, um, there are tons of different formats out there. Now, I've played in as well as run and organized a number of different tournaments, both for board games, RPGs, and CCGs, and have seen a ton of different ones. And actually, going way back uh, to the 90s, Sean, myself, and my friend Mike actually hosted, and I may be wrong on this, but at the time we were told this, the first Magic the Gathering tournament in Canada. I don't know if that's confirmed, but at the time we were told it was the first in Canada, maybe it's the first in Southwestern Ontario. No matter what, it was one of the first magic tournaments held in Canada. This is back in the days of Revise at our local university, the University of Windsor. So we've been involved, like not heavily in the tournament scene, but we've definitely seen and done a lot with it. Now, there are a number of things to keep in mind when arranging a tournament, perhaps even more so when trying to arrange things between friends. <laughs> Some things you might want to keep in mind on top of the more specific tips we're going to get to uh, are about your group. If your group has one or more players who aren't especially competitive, for instance, make sure they're going to be okay with this, especially right. if you have other more competitive players in the group. One thing that you find in an open tournament is that it attracts people that want to be there and compete to be the best. That's not always the case in a friendly group of gamers. 
Yeah, I agree. And we have talked about competition in board games. We've got an earlier podcast that we talked about that. I didn't drag up the number for that, but we'll throw a link in the show notes that you might want to listen to about how much is too competitive and what to deal with overly competitive players. But I will say, once you make it a tournament, you then up that dedication and competitiveness level. You, you've now made it a contest, not just a game night. And what's good about the format we're going to talk about is people who just enjoy playing games can still take part and just not worry about their score. And I like that format because it takes that into consideration. But not everyone likes that kind of, of head-to-head competition, that extra level of comp- competition added to game night. Now, I have to assume Courtney's group's involved or he wouldn't have asked in the first place, but I do think it was worth bringing up. Now, one of the things I thought of when we got this question, I, I strongly considered listing all different formats all different tournament formats i've seen and kind of do the pros of cons of each and I, I there's a lot of formats out there you can google it you can look up different formats you can look up the the big thing is you want to look at organized play so like look up fantasy flight games organized player dungeon dragons organized play and all that and i thought of doing that but it could take for one it'll take a long time we could probably do an episode on every different format uh, as tonight kind of proves uh, what I decided to do instead, and I think this, in, to me, is the better option, is over the years, I've discovered what I think is the best format for a board game tournament, specifically board games. Of all the different ones I played, I love this. Everyone I've introduced to this format loves it. And as soon as I mentioned I was going to cover this question, I had four of my friends jump up on Facebook and be like, well, just tell them about the Blitz. So this is what I think is the best format for this. Now, while we have more specific recommendations below, some other questions aside from the tournament format are how much competitive versus friendly play do you want Mm -hmm. over a given period of time? Uh, Just something to mix in over the summer, something to fill a regular role at a game night, or maybe just try something smaller out, and if it works, then expand from there. But we know you want a tournament of some sort, (laughs) so let's get to the one that the bellhop loves. Yeah, and the one we're going to present here once I get into my final thoughts will work for a single night event, or you could stretch it out over months. It will work both ways. So the format I want to talk about tonight, I was introduced to by Mark Langtot, who at the time was the owner of the great Canadian board game Blitz, was the official name. This is uh, like a trademark name. You can still go to the website. It hasn't been updated in many years. And he created this thing called the Great Canadian Board Game Blitz while working with Fan Expo. This is a nationwide board game tournament so all of canada that was held each year that did regional qualifiers so you would have a regional qualifier in windsor and then the winner of the windsor event would then get tickets to fan expo canada which is big it's it's san diego comic con in canada It is the biggest pop culture con in all of canada now winners would also get gaming prizes but the the person who came in first would get to go to fan expo and take place in the finals as the tournament evolved Sometimes we're semi-regionals, right? So if you won in Windsor, you would have to go to London to compete. And if you won in London, you got to go to the finals of Fan Expo. But the general thing was it was a nationwide tournament where the winners got to go to Fan Expo. And getting into Fan Expo is an experience and an expensive one. So even just getting Mm -hmm. to go to the event for free is a significant prize. Yeah, if I remember correctly, it was $180 Canadian value. That was on top of any prizes or anything else. Now, I'm sad to say that Mark quit. Uh, It was just he had other things going on in his life. He had graduated from university or something like that. He moved away from Canada. Uh, So he was no longer in charge. And the official event made it two more years. Unfortunately, just kind of fell apart after that without Mark driving. Now, what I've personally done, I know I did run official Canadian board game blitz here in Windsor, I think, three times at this point. But after that, I borrowed the format. I I took the Great Canadian Board Game Blitz format, and yes, I did ask Mark if I was allowed to use this. He was like, yeah, go for it. Just don't use our branding, right? Because it was his thing. And I have used that format for every single tournament I have run since. Um, At this point, I think our first one was in 2013. So that's a lot of years of Blitz tournaments I've run. Uh, And to honor its roots, I call it a Canadian Board Game Blitz style tournament. I threw out the great Canadian board game blitz, so I'm not at least competing with that, but I use the Canadian board game blitz style tournament. Now, one of the real major advantages of this tournament, though it can be a shock to some, is that no one is eliminated. Mm -hmm. If you play in the tournament, you're in it for the long haul. 
This is great for players who want to get in every minute of gaming they can, but can be a shock to those who want to play but don't consider themselves good enough to win and expect to bow out or be knocked out after a round or two. That said, there is um, rule concessions for people leaving partway through and joining in. So if it is more than you expected to bite off, you don't have to necessarily stay to the end, though it is encouraged. Now, things I love about the Blitz include the fact that it is no elimination. So you don't show up and then the best player in the room beats you on the first round and you're done and you got to sit and wait while everyone else finishes or go home. I love the fact it's no elimination. I also like that it's point-based. And the points are rewarded for first through fourth place in each game. Even last base gets some points. And the amount of points are based on the length and weight of the game being played. Now, what I love about this is that losing one match doesn't mean you're out of the running. And we've seen things where a player will win every single game, but their last big game, and then get defeated overall by a player who came in second every round of the game. And in most cases, we've never had anyone sweep a blitz where they won every game. So it's always had that fluctuation where the scores mattered. And the fact that you got a fourth in one case may be compared to the fact the guy in second got a three and that's how they beat you out. Well, and as you can expect among gamers, this is a whole other level to the competition mm -hmm. with people taking the time to work out their scores and potential paths to victory and metagaming the whole thing. Yeah, and actually the, another part I really like is, is the, the power gamers get into the metagame of it and trying to decide where they're going to sit and who they're going to play against and what games they should play next. That, that's a good aspect of it. Now, another thing I like is it is a timed event. So you are on, on a schedule, but there's wiggle room. So each round only lasts a set amount of time, but there's a consideration there for games that are going over the time based on how quick all of the tables overall are playing, not just one table. Right. Intended originally as a single day event, this mm. makes for a solid day packed full of gaming. Yeah. Now, the other thing I love, and actually I got to say is my favorite part, is the game selection is done by the players. Not only what games they'll play, but who they'll be playing against. This adds that meta. The, the players may strategically pick games they're good at or players to compete against because they have a rivalry or they're like, oh, I'll easily beat this person. And I love it when that happens and the other person beats them. I like the fact that, that there's that meta game of picking what to play and getting the list out ahead of time so people actually spend weeks leading up to the event practicing certain games. But then they might not get into that game they spent all the time practicing on. This just adds a whole new level to the tournament above just playing games. And this will make a whole lot more sense once we get into the details of how you pick those games yes. later on in the uh, episode. So maybe I did this in the wrong order. Maybe I should have started with the rules, but to me, this just made more sense to talk about it this way. But before getting into the rules, the big question Courtney asked was, how do I pick games for a tournament? That was actually his number one question when he asked this. So I'm going to talk about how I pick games for the Canadian board game blitz style, but this applies to any tournament. Now, the blitz is based on a number of rounds, and you're going to set a length for each round. And it's based on three different game lengths. Now, for a full day tournament, this is a, you're, you're showing up in the morning for, for registration. You're going to be there all day. I usually go with five rounds. We do two short games, which are under an hour, two medium games, which are up to an hour and a half, and one final round featuring a two hour plus game. I do try to limit that to two and a half, three. No, no, no uh, 18xx games coming out in the last round. But I try to limit it to two, three hour games. Right. So Twilight Imperium 3, 18xx, not no. your board game blitz game. Again, though, I got to say, speed. <laughs> I do got to say that uh, the way Courtney's talking about it and something I suggested earlier is saving the last another day for the final event. You probably could throw out a bigger, huge game like one of those in there. So. All right, this is where it pays to really know your games, and mm -hmm. it actually helps to know your players and how long games usually take, since we all know some groups can, re can really vary play times compared yes. to those listed on the box. Yeah, if you've got a group that's got some players that are, are heavy on AP and they like to plan out every move and take a lot of time, you may want to up those time limits. Now, for the short games, right at the beginning of the Blitz, we always do two short games. I always try to pick a filler, like a real filler, like 15 minutes to half an hour filler, just to get us for one ahead of schedule to give us a bit of buffer room for the rest of the event. Plus, it's just to get people gaming together. So you want something light and fun, because I got to say the one hour, the one hour games don't give a ton of points. So it's not going to hurt that much if you lose in the first round. So I do usually try to throw one of those in. And then same thing with the first medium game. 
I try to throw like in, instead of aiming for an hour and a half, I aim for like a one hour game instead of an hour and a half game again to build in that buffer. Because for us, the entire event, and I got to admit, this is, is, a, is a stretch, is 8 to 10 hours. Now, note that does include about an hour for breaks in there, including often a dinner break where we either order in food or everyone else goes and gets food. But it's uh, even with that, you're still looking 8 to 10 hours. Now, as mentioned earlier, that's a lot of gaming in one day. Yeah. It can be rough on players not used to that kind of back-to-back -back gaming and can also be less than healthy if no one is keeping an eye out for each other, drinking and eating and even just moving around between your games. Yes. So yeah, there's a strong recommendation that I actually didn't have in the show notes here is make sure there's water on hand. If you are the organizer, go to Costco and buy a flat of water. Make sure that's available. We happen to run our events at an awesome local game store that provides water for free. Um, plus, make sure people get up between rounds and move around. Now, as for what Courtney is looking for instead of doing like it's your regular game night, right? You're not going to do an eight to 10 hour event. What I would do is break this up over multiple sessions. And what I'd probably do is try to mix it up with a short and a long game or sorry, a short and a, in a medium game. So each game night you fit in what two to three hours of playing, right? So you got a short game and a medium game. Maybe you throw a filler in there, have that go over a month. And just, you know, first week of the month, you start the tournament. Second week of the month, you play another short medium, another short medium. The last week of the month, that's when you throw out the big long game. That's a whole three, four hour game. And then you just total the points at the end of the entire event. Any way you manage it, record keeping is important yes. for every type of tournament. Now, times. So I, it, I make it sound simple, right? Just pick a short, medium and a long game. The way I do this, uh, because I run these events for the public, if it's my own game group, I have a good idea how long our games take. Like, I know our group can hammer off Terraforming Mars in three to four hours, whereas other groups might take six. What I use is Board Game Geek, honestly. Like, I actually find the playing times listed on Board Game Geek to be accurate as long as people are focusing, which they tend to for a tournament. When you're playing casual and you're chatting and you're talking about the fact there's a new He-Man cartoon coming on Netflix, your games go longer. But if you're playing a tournament and everyone's focused on the game and playing to win, the board game geek times are really good for the majority of games. Yes, there's going to be one or two that are way off. Uh, Anachrony is one I made a big mistake on because it listed for two and it went four hours, our last blitz. It does have a thing, but that is what I'll do. I'll go on board game geek. And what I do is I look at my games and I look at my favorite games and I look at some new games I've got and I go on board game geek and I put them in rows and I put short games, medium games, long games. And then I start moving them around a bit if I think they're like this, this medium could go in this category and so on. But yeah, Board Game Geek is a great spot to get timing. As mentioned before, though, you're in a great position already to know the intricacies of your own group and how yeah. accurate those times will be for you and yours. So now what you're going to need is, you know, your time limits, right? So you kind of have an idea what games you want. You're going to need a number of games so you can break your group into tables of three or four, preferably four. What you want to have is as many tables of four as possible, and then maybe one table of three, or as many as four, and then two tables of three. You never want two players only. Now, Courtney notes he had a group of 10 to 12. So if I was making the list for a blitz for his event, I would start with three games. And then what I like to do is throw in one more game, which just gives you more options each round that people can pick from. Every four players, you're going to add another game. So... What I'll also do is once I get up to 30 or so players, because again, I've run these as tournaments, I'll throw in a second extra game again, just to increase the variety. Now you'll also need one quick but strategic game for the very end of the tournament in case there's a tie. You want this to be an abstract strategy game that involves some thinking, but isn't going to take really long at all. Now, as for what games you want, there is the most important rule, and I have messed this up, probably every blitz I pick one game that somehow doesn't fit this and it just didn't click in my head is that you must pick the type of game where there is a clear winner and players getting second, third, and fourth. You have to be able to rank the players at the end of the game. You need to be able to rank one through four. For example, you would think Catan is a great tournament game, but Catan is a race to 10 points. And when one player gets 10 points, the game ends, everyone else just lost. They're not first, second, third. Yes, you could count up everyone's points and find a way to do it, but rules as written, there's one winner at Catan, everyone else is a loser. So it is actually not a good Blitz game. Right, and firm tiebreakers in the rules can yeah. be super important. You do not want people arguing over such things, and you don't want a game where there's a tiebreaker for one and two, but they don't care about mm -hmm. anything after that. 
or a tie breaking in conditions A, B, and C. But beyond that, congratulations, you deserve to tie. Because yes. there are games out there where at a certain point they just say, no, no, it's a tie now. And yes. that's bad. In that case, I would add in like randomize who won. In that case, if because you know what, every now and then you can only go so deep on tiebreakers. <laughs> Some games have a fifth tiebreaker and still get... Once you get that far, yeah, okay, maybe you do deserve to tie. Now, other than that, I'll pick a mix of true classics. Um, I always try to have classics. I expect people to know Carcassonne, Power Grid, Alhambra. Again, not Catan. Um, usually something new I'm excited about, something that came out in the last year, something I picked up at Origins, the, the new hotness, right? That's going to get people to enter your tournament. Again, with your personal friends, it's a little different. But if you want, like, I'd want to throw, I don't, I don't know if Wingspan has first, second, third, fourth, but if it does, I would want to have Wingspan in there right now. That's one of those games that everyone seems to know and love. Now, since Courtney's talking about playing with his own group, it should be easier, right? You should be able to pick games you know your group enjoys. Now, something else that I think would be cool, which is something I can't do when I organize a Blitz, is rotate who picks the games so that you have different ones. Like, for example, I said with 12 people, you need, um, you need four games for each round well you just divide that up so if you're playing two rounds you pick eight of those 12 people to bring the games one week and then a different group of eight the next week or you go hey you always bring that you have the most medium weight games you bring all the mediums you bring all the lights or whatever and share it up or pair people up so that like this group brings a game one week and next week you bring a game i think that'd be really cool that is something i haven't been able to do myself just make sure everyone knows in advance you don't want people arguing over who plays what just because you've got eight games for 10 people mm -hmm. due to a simple misunderstanding about who was bringing what. That yeah. game count we got to earlier for how many games, for how many people is actually important to, yes. as we go on. Yeah, you don't want it works with extra games, but you really don't want to distill it down. You want people to be able to practice ahead of time and know what's coming and read up the rules ahead of time. And note, I did say it would be four games. So if that's four games per round for 12 people, not four games total. You would be, if you're going to fit in two short rounds in a medium, you would need 12 games. Now, the other thing I do is to make sure I only pick games I personally can teach. Because according to the Blitz rules, you don't require people to know the games before they enter, which is one of the main reasons I add in padding when looking at game time. So there's, because there's a chance I could end up teaching every game at a Blitz. So thankfully that hasn't happened yet. To help with this, what I will do is I take the time to go on Board Game Geek, Esoteric Order of Gamers, and find rule summary sheets and, and any types of player aids I can and laminate them and toss them in my Blitz games so that when people do get the game to the table, there's that nice big, hey, here's how to play thing right on top. Esoteric ga Order of Gamers for the win yeah. can really help out, especially with people who know the game but don't know the mm. game. It's often that little sh crib sheet is often enough to get them over the hump without having to take the time for a full teach, which especially in a one day tournament can really draw things out. Yeah. Now that you guys the games picked out, you're going to need some way to track everyone's score. Now I have official source sheets we, we have for doing public play events. Um, but where we track a lot more data is on an Excel sheet once we get home at night. Uh, we also record what games got played in order to look back next year so we can go, oh, who picked what, what games didn't get picked, so we have a better idea of what we can put in. And I'll also make notes on people's score sheets, like if there's a game like I put in, what did I put in the one year? Um, oh, it's one of Deanna's favorite games, Attica. And I wasn't even thinking about the fact that that's a, if someone connects both their temples, they just win and everyone else doesn't. And I'm like, oh, bad choice, Attica, not good. Yeah, and realistically, you can't have too much data hmm. once it's into a spreadsheet. You never know how much, how you might want to sort it. Now, at home, you might be able to enter data right into the sheet and skip paper score sheets. I would not suggest doing this, hmm. as a paper trail can help answer questions during the tournament. Again, especially if you're drawing it out over a month or even yeah. over the whole summer. And not only that, the way this tournament is designed, the score sheets are actually used. As part of the game selection, for one, it's used to randomize player order. You just shuffle everyone's score sheets and draw one. And that's one way to randomize the players. It's also how you determine a tiebreaker when picking games as you just shuffle the two people. Plus, uh, if you don't have score sheets, there's a whole system where you're putting things on the games to indicate who's going to play which game. So you need something. So to me, it's just like do it all on one sheet. Fair. 
Plus, people like to compare their scores in between rounds, go, what do you got and what do you have? And I'm going to make sure I play against you or heck, I don't want to play against you and so on. All right, you got players, you got games, they've all bought in. Here are the official Canadian Board Game Blitz rules. Game rules. Rules for each game must be played raw, rules as written, straight out of the box. No variations or house rules or expansions to be used unless otherwise noted. And I say otherwise noted, that's the tournament organizer has the final say. If you are certain this game only plays well with the expansion, get everyone to buy in and run it with the expansion. But in general, that's not in question once you've started. Once you've started, you're playing raw. Now, if there are rule ambiguities in the game, I would try to find an errata or FAQ on Board Game Geek, print it, and throw it in the box. The other thing, I didn't do this, but Mark, who ran this tournament, had a binder with all of the game rules in there that he had printed out. So if a rule question did come up, you could easily flip through his binder. And he had, you know, notes and stuff in there, which I think is a great idea. I just haven't taken the time to do it myself. The important thing is make sure everyone is on the same page before you start. And again, the default is raw. The default is to use the rules as written. Now, there is one thing I've done to modify this. That was Mark's rule. My rule is ignore the start player rules in the game and either roll dice or use Chwazi. This avoids the youngest player getting an unfair advantage or the oldest player always going first or the tallest person at your tournament getting advantage over everyone else for some stupid arbitrary thing. Yeah. Don't get me started on start player rule. Just use Schwazi or maybe dice in a pandemic world so you're not all touching <laughs> the same device. Now, along with Mo's mention of including rules and or errata, especially if you're having games brought in by different people make sure they are complete. Mm -hmm. You do not want to find out an hour in that you need to improvise some missing piece, especially in games where piece count matters. Yeah, good call there. Um, thankfully, this isn't something that's come up at any of our tournaments, but yeah, I can totally see it happening. Now, the next blitz rule is in regard to learning games. As noted earlier, you don't have to know the games to play. But realize knowing the game is going to provide a strategic advantage. So players are encouraged to play games they know because it is a tournament you want to win. Now, if needed, the rules for each game will be explained before starting and any rule questions during the game will be answered. For this, I always ask if someone at the table about to play the game is able to teach it. Like, hey, you four both play this. Do you all know how to play? No. Does anyone know how to teach this? Yes or no. If not, I will teach the game. Now, this does involve some trust and knowing who are the game teachers in your area. Like, I know if I sit down and Charles is at the group and he says he'll teach it, we're good. But I do know other local gamers. They're like, I'll teach it. I'm like, no, no, don't worry. I'll handle it. Right. So, you know, handle that with some tact. Now, again, with a smaller group like Courtney's, hopefully everyone knows the games are about to be played. Now, one thing to do that can really help with this is publish the list of games to be featured at the tournament ahead of time. This gives players a chance to learn and honestly, to also practice up before the tournament day. Right. And I might even encourage players to go and watch a specific rules video so that everyone starts mm -hmm. from the same point if there's any concern. And actually, I hadn't thought of that at all. But now with most game stores having Wi-Fi's and tablets being pretty common, I think I would actually bring a tablet to the con or the event and just have a bunch of bookmarks to like watch it played, Rado and gaming rules vids and just literally set it down on the table and go here, watch this while I go teach this other game over here or have multiple tablets. Yeah, and gaming rules for the win. He has saved me from being completely lost yeah. on games on BGA any number of times. Yeah, a big fan of all three, to be honest. Paul is great. Next, we have the rules for time limits. Now, this is important. It, it sounds kind of flippant, but everyone is expected to take their turns in a timely fashion, which includes planning your moves on other players' turns whenever possible. This is the whole thing I was talking about. This is a tournament. It will require focus. To get games done in the allocated one hour or two hour time slot using Board Game Geek does require you sit and play the game, not get up and go grab a drink and go chat with someone or talk about what's going on in the world recently. After the allotted time has passed, so after the first hour or hour and a half or two hours, if there's one table left to finish their game, they have 10 minutes to wrap up. Even if not completed, the game ends. Now, if this happened, the organizers will work with the entire table and use the rules to determine player positions. In most cases, most of the games you're throwing out are going to be score-based games, so it's easy to just stop the game and go with whatever score everyone currently has. Now, this only kicks in 
when there's one table left, right? So if two groups are falling behind and still playing, that's fine. They're good to keep going until one of them finishes. Then the other group only has 10 minutes to finish. And this is important. Yeah. So in a friendly setting of gamers who know each other, this is the sort of rule that might be relaxed or using as a method of taunting people forevermore. Yeah. Uh, you know your group best. And again, if you're breaking this up over multiple weeks and you're only doing one game a week, well, you know, you've got five hours to play that week. Maybe three of them or four of them are taken up playing the tournament and you only get, uh, you know, an hour of other gaming in otherwise. Now, here's the part I think most people have been waiting for, uh, game selection. This is my favorite part of the tournament format. And I probably could have just made this the entire episode, except Courtney actually asked about how to pick games. So you're going to start off by putting the games for the next round in a central spot. I, I, I put them on a table and all the players gather around and look at what games are in and they're like, oh, look. And, and to be honest, I actually, I, for foreshadowing, I put them in piles in order off to the side so people can come in and see what's coming up. And I put them on the table. Now, again, in Courtney's case, with 10 to 5 or 10 to 12 players, you're going to have four games on the table. Now, remember, only three of these are going to actually get used. So the bone, there's one of those games that won't get played. Now, the first round of the Blitz, you're going to randomly determine player order. Now, what we do now is we just shuffle the score sheets. So we just shuffle them up as best we can. Sometimes we'll use a deck of cards and we'll have hand out people cards and then shuffle all those cards and have people write their card because just cards are easier to shuffle than a bunch of sheets of paper. You can do whatever you want. Now, with 12 people, you can even probably roll a D20. You might want to go to D100 because you're going to get doubles. And I just hate rolling and rolling and rolling. I know the game store is always like, grab a D20. I'm like, there's 10 of us. Someone's going to roll doubles. Give us something a little more random than that. So you're going to get whoever's first are then going to look at the games, decide what they want to play and put their score sheet on top of it. They're like, this is mine. And you'll see people get like excited about this. They like slam them down on the games. Then the next player puts them on the game they want to play. Now, this could be the same game as the first player or one of the other selections. And this keeps going this way. Now, once the required number of games for the round have any sheets on them, that extra game is removed. So again, in Courtney's case, once three of the games have score sheets on them, we remove that fourth game. Now, as soon as any game gets all four sheets on it, those players grab the game, go find a table and start playing. Once all games have been selected and players have all sat down ready to play, that's when the actual timer for the round starts. Now, for the second round of the Blitz, you reverse this player order so that the player who picked last in the first round gets to pick first in the second round. This is to try to make it more fair for everyone. But after that, it's all about metagame. You're going to total up everyone's points, and the player with the most points overall so far in the tournament gets to pick first. The player with the second most points overall picks second and going on. This does give an advantage to players who win their games, which I think is fair in a tournament. Now, if there is a tie, player order is randomized between those players. Again, we'll just, if we have three people with the same thing, I'll shuffle the three sheets up and hand them out or I'll shuffle their cards again. And whatever you do, make it random, dice, schwazi, shuffling. Just play, pay attention to randomness. Yes. <sighs> now, after playing the game, players are going to get points based on what rank they finish. Now, this is weighted by the length weight of the game. One hour games give five, four, two, or one points. Again, that's for first, second, third, fourth. 1.5 hour games, 7.5, 6, 3, or 1.5. And long games giving 10, 8, 4, or 2 points. And we have added in other things. Like I've thrown in a 15 minute game, like super quick filler game. Like we're all going to play Go Cuckoo. No, because Go Cuckoo has someone win, whatever. Super quick filler game. And we'll give, you know, 2.5, 2, 1, or 0.5 points. Or we'll throw in a three hour game and possibly do, you know, adjust the math accordingly. Yeah, so as you can see, finishing third in a long game is mm -hmm. as good as finishing second in a short, and that's part of that whole thought process. Those 10 points for first in the last oh, yeah. game can really swing your score around. Yeah, the thing to watch for is you don't want too many long games. You want your finale to, like, I tend to do one long game at the end. Every now and then I've done two, but that 10 points is so much higher than the five points and the, the two points and whatever for, for earlier scoring. That you don't you you want the big finale to be big. Now there are some officially rule official rules for finishing games. If you start a game, please do everything possible to finish it. In the case that's not possible, the organizer will work with the other players during that game to find the best solution. 
And honestly, this is on a game by game basis. I don't have any hard or fast rules here. This could include just continue the game without that player, their pieces stay on the map and you work around them. It could mean just, sorry, we got to stop the game and score it where we are now. Or even better is find someone, the organizer or someone who's not playing in the tournament or even someone who's finished up an earlier game, sit in and finish playing for that player. No matter what the reason the person had to step out, no points are going to be awarded to the player who left. I realize the CAC seem a little vindictive and there are some valid reasons to leave, but it is a tournament. We do expect people to try to stay and play through. Right. So again, with a friendly group, you're more able to be flexible about this as compared to an official tournament with prizes and, you know, yeah. major money on the line. The other thing you don't want is someone who knows they're going to lose walking away because they know they're going to lose. I definitely had that at tournaments. and I do try to convince people to stay and finish. Now, with that rule, there are rules for missing a game or missing a round or joining in once a, a blitz has already started. Now, it is expected in general that all players will take part in all rounds. Players may choose to skip a round for whatever reason that may be. Now, in that case, they get no points for the round. The thing with this happening is, as the organizer, you may need to adjust the number of games in future rounds. Like with Courtney's sake, once you start getting down, to, if you drop down to eight players, you no longer want four games out anymore. You only want three games out, and you're only going to use two of them. So that is something you do have to adjust for if someone steps out. Similarly, someone can join in partway through. And honestly, there's no real penalty to this. They just start off at zero points. And if they're joining in in a later round where there's longer games, there's a chance, and I've seen this happen, where someone joined in halfway through a blitz and won it because they were that good at those longer games. Now, one of the things that does come into play here is they are going to go last in game selection during the first phase, at least the first time, and probably the next couple until they get enough points to get into the ranking. And again, the organizer may need to adjust the number of games. So this is something where you may not be able to allow someone to jump in if you don't have enough games present, which is an issue. So this is the reason when I organize a blitz, I actually bring a few extra games, but make sure people know what's in the blitz and what's not. Like if you have some spares in case people show up, let people know these are the spares. You don't need to learn those ahead of time, but you know what? If we suddenly get a big rush, like we're expecting 40 people to come out and 40 people signed up and bought tickets, but all of a sudden at registration, we get 60. These games are here just in case. Right. And again, this uh, with a friendly group, these is, this is more flexible again. This is not, you're not competing the same way you are uh, at an official tournament. So uh, yeah. you're able to be more flexible with that aspect in your own personal group. Winner. Winner is the player with most points after all rounds are completed. If there's a tie, the tied players play a quick strategic game to determine the overall winner. Most of the time we've had this, it's always been two players who tied. In that case, I love to throw either Onitama or the Duke. And if it's more than that, there's some others. Blockus and Quirkle are two of my favorites because most people know how to play and they're fairly quick. Yeah, don't pick something like chess. Strategic yeah. is good, but quick is also really important. Now, I personally think this format is perfect in for running a tournament, right? Trying to the prizes and getting people out. But I honestly think it would be great for a small game group like Courtney's. Because the fact that I'm like, if I knew the same people would show up at the local game store every week, I'd be tempted to run an overall blitz throughout the year or something like that. Now, what I would do is what I mentioned earlier. I would make this a monthly event. It starts fresh the first game night of the month and will run for four or five weeks, depending on how long the month is. Now, if that's a little too frequent, maybe you try it once a quarter and I'd be tempted to just keep it running like every month you go through and then next month you start another blitz, next month you start another blitz. The people who take it serious are going to take it seriously and the people who aren't are still going to play games and have fun. Now, maybe I would throw in some neat rules uh, for like the winner gets to pick the games in the next tournament or the winner gets to determine what length games like this week we did two shorts next week. I want to play two medium games or something like that. Toss in some little incentives for being ahead each week. And you may even want to do subscoring. So do a mini blitz for that week where you have your overall score, but then someone still wins that night. You might want to throw that in there for even more competition. And again, you might not be looking for this much tournament play, yeah. and that's okay. But if it does go well, this format is so flexible and expandable, you're ready to go. Yeah. Now, what I would do in your case, and what I have done whenever I've run a blitz, is reach out to a local game store. Now, I don't, Courtney didn't mention if he plays at his house or whatever. I'm going to guess 12 people. You're probably going to some central location to play. I would reach out to that location and say, hey, I'm going to be running a tournament. We do sponsor this. 
because for one, this is a great way for the store, the the venue, whatever it happens to be, the bar, whatever, to get people in. And for a local game store, a board game blitz tournament just sounds way cooler than open game night, play what you want. Now, the other thing we've done is if the local game store doesn't step up and help is we've charged an entry fee. Now, what we did for most tournaments is all of the entry fee goes to prizes. And what we'll do is we will take the money and buy gift certificates from the game store I'm running it at with the winner getting 60% of the proceeds, second getting 30, and third per getting 10. Now, for Chuck Courtney, if he's doing a 12-person event and he's charging 10 bucks a head, you're looking at $72 to win, $36 for second, and $12 for third. Now, the other thing is we've been able to do that and then have like the local store double that amount because they're doing gift certificates, right? That's where that, that relationship would be great. Another thing we've done just to keep it interesting and to encourage people to play is door prizes. Small little things you can give away. I happen to have a ton of stuff from various tabletop days over the years. I don't know if Courtney's group has anything like this, but the end of each round, random prize. Anyone could win them. Or just be like, you know what? The person in sixth gets something next round and you give them some little small thing. Now, the final thing that we've done, most of what I've done with the Blitz lately has turned it into a charity event tied into our Extra Life Gaming Marathons. And what I do with that is half the money goes to the charity and half goes to prizes. And again, I'll try to find sponsors to supplement those prizes, whether that's cash or goods or gift certificates or whatever. I'll throw that all into the pot. A lot of those will become random prizes, but with the entry fee trying to go to the charity of choice. Right. So this was a, a pretty detailed look at only one, but our favorite form of board game yeah. tournament. Now in the in the chat room, we got a couple of quick little comments to point me out. One thing is really stay off the phone. Yes. Uh, this is a again, time is important. And if, if it's a friendly group, you can change that some, but you still don't want to be too lax about things. Um, the one is mentioned is point salad is great of those little filler. Uh, yeah, short 15 games. minute quick. Yeah. Yeah. I said fitting those in Imhotep, I actually put in there because Imhotep with the base A, B side, just start with the A side. You can hammer off a game of that in less than half an hour. Yeah. That's and then one of the ones I like And then have. finally, uh, Tech in the chat room, who's been in involved in some of these, points out that, again, those random prizes can really help encourage people who are going to be there for the whole day, but but aren't necessarily that, that super competitive winning type mm -hmm. to keep playing because you never know when you might turn up with just something for being there and playing along and having fun. Uh, so those are the detailed in question instructions on how to run a great Canadian board game blitz style board game tournament, our favorite board game tournament formats. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhops. Welcome to the Bellhops digital tabletop and a preview of Blood Bowl 3 the latest version of Blood Bowl in its digital format, updated to the new second season rules of the physical game. Big thanks to Cyanide and Nacon for allowing us access to this closed beta of the game and for finally lifting the embargo, preventing us from talking about it the last few weeks. Though it would still be awesome if you would send us a second key so we can play against each other and tell you how online multiplayer works. Nacon, come on, Cyanide. Blood Bowl 3 was originally scheduled to be released this August, but due to various contributing factors, this release date has now been pushed back to February 2022 for the full release, though there will be an early access release on Steam in September of 2021. Currently, we are in a limited, closed beta of the game to experience what it has to offer, and as I've played all the various versions to date, I consider myself somewhat of a fan, and I took the reins on this review. Yeah, it was offered to me, and I'm like, no, Sean is a huge Blood Bowl fan. He has played every version I have. I have played the original game, and I played uh, Blood Bowl 1, and I think I tried Blood Bowl 2. Blood Bowl 1, I played a ton on the Xbox. Blood Bowl 2, I barely got into, so I passed on to him. Now, the most important thing to note here is that this is a beta version of a game that isn't going to be released until February next year. And we all know how finished video games are when they first release. Well, this is half a year before that. So anything we say tonight is subject to change as the game gets further developed. Now, the big feature of this new release, on top of the usual bumps in graphics and qualities you expect from a new version of a game six years after the last, is the significant rule changes that have come out. This includes new skills, 
and a game, change in the mechanics for ball handling and passing mm. that have added a new stat to the game. Additionally, stat terminology have been changed to match up with other GW properties so that instead of an agility of, no, of eight, it becomes a nine plus, reflecting the target number needed instead of the value. Additionally, the max mus movement has been reduced to 9. Sorry for the Skaven fans used to skittering across at 10. Uh, and the big one is passing as a stat. No longer is your agility the measure of your passing ability, though it still determines catching. As well, pa players with a null passing stat auto-fumble any attempt to pass. Oh, that's quite the change, actually. Now, all these rule changes are due to the digital version of Blood Bowl keeping up with the physical version. Games Re Workshop fairly recently re decided to bring back the head coach of the Champions of Death and bring Blood Bowl back from the dead with a new Blood Bowl second season edition, which I think is the fifth or sixth actual edition of this game of fantasy football. As well, there are major additions to the pregame mechanics for fans and team value, with a big addition in the Prayers to Nuffle, where the bigger the difference between team values, the more prayers the lower-ranked team will get. And let me tell you, it is an interesting assortment of things that can come up that both help you and or punish your opponent. Okay. Now, finally, before the game even starts, the kickoff table has also been rewritten, with many old favorites still available and unchanged, while others have changed quite a bit overall being a bit more balanced than the former sure. table had been, uh, including no more players getting killed by rocks from fans, which was <laughs> just the most painful thing that could happen in a Blood Bowl 2 match when you walk out onto the pitch and before the game starts, you have dead players. Although I gotta say it's quite thematic. It's, it's the, the traveler <laughs> of football board games. So the prayers to Nuffle are actually a balancing mechanic, which is cool. I, I remember when you first experienced them, I don't think you realized that because you were like, I don't know, I'm making all these <laughs> rolls on tables. Yep. It's interesting, but I just, to me, like, do they need that? Like, why didn't they just balance the teams better? Or is this something that changes as you go through a season where winning will get you more star players and re-rolls, which gives you an advantage, and this is a way to offset that? So it's to allow team uh, play between teams that aren't uh, good matches otherwise. So team values or your actual player uh, value. So you've got a, a 1.2 million cost team versus a 900,000 cost team. The prayers help offset that, you know, all-star player towering over your front line when you get on the field. All right. When you start a game, though, aren't you at the same level? Uh, it depends. So there's, okay. there's a bunch of different ways. And uh, the pre-made teams are all of varying values. And you get a certain amount of money you can spend on your first team when you're creating your own, but you know, you might not spend the whole thing. You might save it okay. up for later. There's Fair different enough. ways. So this whole Nuffle thing was brand new to me. I had never heard of this before. So I did some research and first off figured out what Nuffle comes from. Uh, as a hint, think of what sport Blood Bowl is based on. Now I learned that the character of Nuffle, the God of Blood Bowl was added in 2015 which I don't know if that was one of the times they resurrected the board game or if that was just when Blood Bowl 2 came out or whatever. Um, long after I started and stopped playing Blood Bowl, I hadn't touched the game. Up to this point, though, from what I understand, Nuffle was just like background. There was, he wasn't really a big role in the game or its mechanics. Yeah, indeed. Well referenced here and there, this is as far the only time Nuffle has actually reached down to intervene in hmm. the leagues he uh, oversees. Now, finally, we get to the game itself. This is where things get interesting, as with the limited teams available in the beta, graphically, it doesn't feel all that much different than Blood Bowl 2. Mm -hmm. Even some of the animations are reused, though there are certainly new character animations as well. Uh, the mechanics and playing, however, are quite different, though, and I have to say I haven't taken to them as easily as I would like. So you mentioned the teams you do get. What teams do you have access to and what play modes can you play right now? So when it comes to teams, you get the Elven Union, Imperial Nobility, and Black Orcs. Okay. Three of the expected 12 races that you will get to play with on release. Uh, now, as for game modes, you get team building and matches, either hot seat ver um, uh, versus AI or a quick match online mode. <clears throat> So 
what did you think about the UI? Why why is this not as easy as it used to be? So moving about the field just feels a bit more complex than it should. Um, selecting a player and then selecting the place you want them to go used to lay out the path they would take and then a second click on that end space would, if you were happy, activate mm -hmm. the action. Now, the, while the field display, I must say, is very well laid out uh, and there are plenty of display options to customize to your preferences. You can turn on and off grids, turn on and off uh, tackle zones, turn okay. on and off uh, skill icons over all your players, changing which area, you know, whether it's your, your stuff displaying or their stuff displaying, very flexible. Um, but getting the player to actually do the thing you want mm. is less natural. And I've managed somehow to even activate my blitz without knowing how or why, um, mm. which is bizarre because you should only be able to do that if you're tackling in a distance. Um, now there's a new player action type bar at the bottom that determines what kind of an action you're taking. So if it's a blitz, okay. passing, handoff action, or unlimited. But I have to say it's not as clear and obvious as you'd hope, even for someone who I consider myself an experienced player with the digital version of Blood Bowl. Hmm. Now, one major change I'm personally not a fan of is how the interface handles rerolls. In Blood Bowl 2, if, for instance, you fail an agility check running through a tackle zone, you're tripped. You watch your player go down hard in the dirt, and then you're offered a reroll, if available, to get a do-over on that turn. Mm -hmm. In this version, if you fail a check, you get a pop-up that asks you if you want to accept or reroll, even if you don't have any rerolls available, mm -hmm. before action occurs on the field. Which means if you glanced away, you may not even know what it is you're accepting or rerolling. And this is something I really hope that gets changed prior to release. That sounds like definitely one to submit to the beta reports. Now, is there some script you can look back on to see what happened to cause that roll? Because I know most of these games based on board games tend to have some kind of log so you can see the mechanics in the background. So as, as with previous games, there is a log. Uh, and as one would expect, its display can be adjusted to off or minimal or large, taking up a big chunk of the screen. But it only reports the results after completion, oh. which includes the team roll. So the initial attempt, which would have failed, isn't complete until you've chosen to re-roll or not, so it doesn't appear on the log. Yeah, at least fix that. Yeah. So additionally, the dice selection in general is larger, uh, making it a, a sort of full screen check rather than just something clearly applicable to the player that's making the action or someone on the field, you know, potentially leading to the same problem if you're not fixated on your screen. Uh, I even ran into a strange event where the player view, the 3D camera move, was blocked by a 3D die that was hanging in the air during a player opponent's movement. Now, to be fair here, not everyone is you with seven monitors and getting distracted in the middle of playing a game. I think most people do focus on the game while they're playing. So <laughs> that might be more of a you issue than a game issue. Possibly. And I mean, again, you're... Blood Bowl is a time limited event, but uh, you know it doesn't it doesn't take too much to for someone to say, "Hey, what are you doing?" And you look away, and your players run, but there. all of a sudden, you know, maybe you had three different moves, and maybe maybe one of the tackle zones you would be willing to accept a fall in. Uh, it's not necessarily clear which of those tackle zones you failed in. All right, fair enough. Now there are a number of other changes to the mechanics of Blood Bowl itself, from star player points, skills added and adjusted for balance into what I feel is overall a more balanced game while changing the strategies for many teams, especially mm. those with high agility. Now that was all changed in the physical version though, and many articles have already been written about that. So I'd like to try and focus more on the digital version. I do have to say the rule changes I've read about just seem to make sense for the theme and style of the game. They seem like a logical progression or a logical next step for Blood Bowl. Indeed, and while there are people out there complaining about some of the pre-game stuff, it makes sense and is a balanced mechanic. Mm -hmm. Most of those people complaining want to continue with some of the broken, unbalanced <laughs> teams that they've just grown to love. Yeah, I will admit, most of the agility complaints uh, seem to be the fact that some teams were a little overpowered because of it before. 
Absolutely. Like I was mentioning Skavens, I mean, literally, the Skavens yeah, had Skaven. a, a, some players that had an agility of 10 and a movement, or like a high agility and a movement of 10, and could just scamper across the entire field over top of other players. Yep. Now, team customization, uh, as you'd expect with advances in graphics, is much greater. Though while you can customize each type of player on your team, you can't seem to customize individual players. So if you've got that one lineman that manages to pull off amazing feats through random luck, you can't really show him off on the field with a different look. Now, currently in the beta, the only teams available for customization are the new Imperials, who are replacing the Breton Bretonians, uh, the Elves, in the form of the Elven Union, and the new Black Orcs, which are a more capable orc. But as you'd expect, they all look top-notch and are well-animated, uh, I did run into a few glitches for their positioning on the field, but that's the sort of thing which I'm, I'm sure is going to be uh, rectified during the pre-release, and the amount of color customization mm. is really impressive. I gotta wonder if being able to customize individual players is something that may get added to the full version. Though, honestly, because this is a Games Workshop license, and I've seen the screenshots, those are definitely what the new minis look like. Right, the sculpts are definitely made to look like the new ones in the second season. And while even in that, you have standard miniatures for each player type. So a runner looked like this, a blitzer looked like this, a blocker looked like this, a lineman looked like this. And it makes sense that the in the team, they would all look the same when the miniatures all do look the same, except for star players and little spell shitty like trolls or tree men or whatever. So, and, and as far as I can tell, like I looked at a couple of the ses second season box sets it, they never did get away from that. So I got to admit, it's way better than my second edition of the game where every miniature was identical and the color of the base told you what it was. Although I, I have to say, I mean, with the level of flexibility you get uh, with, with patterns and paint colors and, and all the paint colors or official GW paints, oh, of course. Uh, um, but it would be nice to be able to just not change their uh, armor or anything, but just put a different paint color. color on one of them. You know, just so you know, oh yeah, that's my, you know special yeah. lineman that I gave it an extra skill to. Um, now, I know all sculpts and animation have to be approved by GW yeah. before they make it into the game. So, yes, fans, all those orcs cheerleaders from Blood Bowl 2 were actually approved by GW. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're probably more sane than I am. Hey, I, I have Blood Bowl metal painted orc cheerleaders. I don't yeah. know if they look like the ones in Blood Bowl 2. <laughs> but I own one. Yeah. Now, what's still missing and quite noticeably is any form of tutorial, which I think would be really nice to introduce the interface changes from mm. the last version. And what's also missing is the solo campaign. Now, as a big bonus from previous editions of the digital game, the solo campaign will be open to any race. Nice. No more stuck getting, uh, getting working with nobody but the dumb loogies from the bottom of the league. Now, additionally, you're going to be able to take your campaign team out of the campaign to use in other game aspects as well. Yeah, this doesn't surprise me, to be honest. Um, the, the last year being stuck at home and not playing as many tabletop games, we've actually gotten to check out a number of digital game previews, and that is definitely something it, I, I have to assume it's like one of the last things they add to the games of the tutorial. Uh, just earlier today, I was playing through a new tutorial and onboarding for a game we played many times, and I was like, oh, they've added onboarding. That would have been nice to see the first time I played this game. Yeah. Now, we are told there are going to be 12 races available at launch. Already, quite a few of your old team favorites uh, are going to be there for uh, AI or quick selection and test matches. Uh, but while it may not be a finished product, I can't at this point report that the AI is any better than it was previously. Not only is the AI still caging re regularly, but I found it was completely ignoring some of the Elven strengths against an orc team, and even at times running away from a loose ball. Weird. Um, so at the moment, skilled, real Umi opponents are still going to be what a real Blood Bowl player needs for a challenge. I do like they at least put the teams in as AIs. I, I When we watched a press release for this, I actually thought you're going to have three teams and you're going to see the three teams playing against each other over and over again. I, I was not expecting, like, at least, like yes, there's only three you can play, but you at least get to see the other one. So that's actually cooler than I thought it would be. Yeah, so the problem is the game, at least at this point, 
just doesn't feel different enough unless you're a huge Blood Bowl fan and need the new rules um, in order to put, rush out and pay AAA game prices for. Uh, the AI is just, you know, not that much more competent than it was in previous mm -hmm. games. Um, and that's an important aspect of a Blood Bowl game, unfortunately. Uh, and though the solo mode not being purely human, I think will be a huge selling oh, yeah. point over prior editions. But I'm still not at a point yet where as someone who has both the previous versions and all the DLC, I'm just not eager to run out and pay for a price for it. Uh, there's little chance of me not buying it again. I am a fan of the game. I am a fan of the Warhammer world. I still enjoy Blood Bowl 2. Uh, and I know that additional content will be coming out for Blood Bowl 3 in time. So it wouldn't be the first time that I'd waited for the Legendary Edition to come out before I actually ended up paying for it. Yeah, this is one I, I will not be rushing out to pick up right away, but I might pick up on sale. Uh, it'll depend probably on what system it puts it out for. I'm not a PC gamer. I work at this desk. I need to be like on my couch playing something. So I, it still sounds good. It sounds like they're doing good things. What it does sound like is a better entry point if you hadn't played the previous game. Indeed, yeah, and the new again, the new rules really do make for a more balanced game yeah. than someone who is used to some of the earlier versions or not used to any of it, or and not being forced to play the same team. Yeah. Like you, I didn't even know that about Blood Bowl too. That I have less interest if I can't start playing Orcs in story mode. Why would I play Blood Bowl? Right. So that's it for our preview of Blood Bowl Three for the PC. I'm sure we'll be back in the future with more reports on this still evolving digital version of one of our favorite Games Workshop games. Welcome to our preview of a prototype version of the light abstract war game, Battle of Gog. Thanks to the designer for lending us this prototype of Battle of Gog to check out. Now, before I say anything else, I need to make everyone well aware that this review is based on an incomplete prototype copy of Battle of God. Now, besides the usual fact that's true for any prototype that the component quality is going to change, there's also a very good chance the rules for this game will also be updated by the time it's released to the public. In the last few weeks I've been trying this game out, the designer has changed a couple of rules significantly. And at this point, I would go so far as to say Battle of Gog is still being developed. This is not a finished game yet. Due to this, all of the information I shared tonight is subject to change, hopefully being tweaked and improved for the better once the game comes out. Now, this is in many ways actually refreshing, <laughs> at least to me, since Kickstarter isn't being used as a finished product ordering system this time, mm -hmm. but actually kickstarting a project that has potential but needs some time and money to get across the finish line. And I totally agree with you here. Like at this point, we are so used to Kickstarter being used for finished games, mainly looking for funding to get it printed or just as using it as a pre-order system to determine the size of a print run. It to me is great to see people still using Kickstarter for what it was created to do, make someone's dream a reality. That said, I will say this made reviewing this a little more difficult than expected. Understandable. It is certainly not something we're used to seeing with Kickstarter previews. Sure, components change and upgrade, but the game itself is usually well done these days. So everything about Battle of Gog is credited to Vitaly Minin. He is not only the designer, but also the developer, artist, lead artist, editor, graphic designer, and more. He actually has every spot on Board Game Geek filled out for this game. This is honestly the epitome of a self-published independent board game. Vitaly is attempting to bring this game to life through a Kickstarter project that launched on June the 8th. Assuming it's successful, the game will be published under his own company, Crazy Box Inc. Now, Battle of God plays two to four players, with our games taking under an hour and a half, very much depending on the number of players playing. Now, I don't think Vitaly has any plans for this to hit retail, so this isn't going to be something you'll be able to pick up at Target, Walmart, or your local game store, so there's no official MSRP, but you can get it on Kickstarter now for $39 US which I've got to say, based on the component, quality here alone is very reasonable. Unfortunately, there's not a lot to see about this on Board Game Geek yet either. So, Yeah, the there's a bunch of free produce production, and that's about it. I yeah. should probably upload a bunch of my images. <laughs> now, in Battle of God, players take on one of four kingdoms in Canaan who are competing for land while trying to find and collect the five scrolls handed down to Gog from God. 
Players start with only three soldiers and will use those initial soldiers to found cities. Once cities are founded, players will begin to collect resources that can be used to improve uh, and hire soldiers, improve the soldiers, improve your cities, increase your resource storage, and more. There are multiple paths for victory, which include controlling the four areas of the map, eliminating an opponent's city, or collecting all five of the scrolls. Now, normally, this is where I would direct you to an unboxing video on YouTube. But due to the fact that this game is a prototype, we didn't want to record a video due to the fact that the components could and probably will change with the final production copy. Correct. Now, my version of Battle of Gog came in a rather thin but large game box. Uh, it's important to know that this is larger than your average game, and there is no way this will fit in a Calex shelf, which is the most popular board game shelf that people tend to pick up or versions of it which I got to say right away is going to turn some gamers off. If I was Vitaly, I would have shrunk everything down just enough to fit. Now, inside this box was a well-designed plastic insert containing a number of different components. You got train tiles, the scroll tiles, some tarot-sized reference farm and ability cards, deck of treasure cards, and a ton of resource tiles in three types. There are also two miniatures, one for Gog and one for the Angel of Retribution, and then a number of dice, larger city dice and smaller soldier dice in each of the four player colors. Now, if they reach a stretch goal, the dice will get kicked up a notch to a new mm. design. And there's also the ability to buy a 16 inch statue of the GOG model as well. Now, the dice do look cool. Um, I actually really like how the city dice have crenellations on them to make them stick out from the soldier dice. As for the statue of GOG, not for me, but hey, someone might be interested in now, one of the components that needs to be called out is the box, because the box itself is a component required to play this game, not just store it. It's designed so that when you put the lid on and then flip it over, the back becomes a sunken playing surface that you're going to use to build and hold the map tiles. Yeah, this is an interesting and unique aspect to the game that we've talked about a little previously, but also means you need to make sure you take care of your box, mm -hmm. which, as noted, is larger than most of your hobby boxes. Now, again, I have a prototype copy. I will admit it showed up and it's been to a couple of reviewers before me and one corner is split, which I just taped together, but it does make it harder to hold the tiles in place. And you need those tiles because the first thing you do in a game of Battle of Gog is build the map. You're going to use the train tiles and the back of the game box. You're going to add them one at a time in player order. These tiles feature a three by three grid of squares with a number of different terrain types and features on them. These include things like water, fish, forests, fields, caravans, and more. Now, the only restriction when placing tiles that can be anywhere on the board is once there's a water section on the map, future tiles that feature water have to be connected if possible. Now, one weird idiosyncrasy in this game that does take some adjusting to is all of us board gamers are used to things being orthogonally adjacent. In this, diagonals are also considered adjacent. This is really important when placing those rivers and the way forests work because cities collecting from a forest can only collect one wood no matter the size of the forest. So amusingly, the demo images on Board Game Geek don't follow those rules about water. That's interesting. Maybe that was a rule that changed since they originally took the pictures. That's highly possible. I had to say grouping the water works well. You end up like a, either one big river through the middle or little lakes. It's, it's actually a good mechanic as far as I'm concerned. Now, once the map's built, each player picks a corner, then puts three level one soldiers on the board. Now, soldiers in this game are represented by small D6 dice, and the pips showing up is what level they are. So you're going to put a bunch of dice out at level one. Now, as mentioned earlier, there are three ways to win a battle a bug game. Take out the last city of one opponent, or in a variant, take out all, but I don't recommend that. Have a soldier in each of the four corners of the map. Note you start the game controlling one, or collect the five scrolls. So I must say the variety of win conditions isn't as common mm -hmm. as I would have expected in board games. Uh, and it's really nice to have, along with this flexible flexible world generation, options as to what direction you want to go in the game to try and win on top of that, you know, in randomness at the beginning. And the other thing I've liked is in our plays, we've shifted. You may be trying to wipe out your opponent's cities, but then you notice you've got three scrolls. So maybe I want to switch the scrolls. Or then you happen to get the right treasure card, which lets you move some troops. You're like, I might be able to grab the four corners. And I like how that's shifted and it gives you more options. Now, each turn in GOG starts with the active player generating resources. Each level one city on the map collects the resources from the eight surrounding squares. Level two or higher cities increase the reach by one more square. Now, the resources include food, which are gained from fields, fish, pheasants, and herd animals, wood, gained from forests, 
gold gained from mines. Now, in addition, if you have at least one city in play, each of your soldiers will collect any resource they're standing on. And if they're also in a zone where an opponent's city is, they prevent that opponent from collecting that resource. Now, at the start of the game, you can only have five of each resource type, but there is a way to increase this. So pretty standard resource concepts there and mm -hmm. some nice, uh, nice plays with blocking and, and things. Now, one thing that's kind of unique to this game, and I almost didn't want to get into because it's a little fiddly, but there is one spot on the map every game that has a scroll on it. If you have a city that can collect from this spot, you collect a scroll the first time you generate resources from that spot. This scroll cannot be stolen unless someone takes out the city. Now, if that spot isn't in a city's collection area, just out of the map somewhere, a soldier landing on that spot can collect a scroll, but only once per game per player. Now, if you go to collect a scroll and there's none left in the supply, you actually get to steal them from another player. And again, collecting five scrolls, there are only five in the game, is one way to win. Seems like the odds of not having to defeat at least one city of a player to get those five scrolls is slim to impossible. In a way, except for there is a way to purchase scrolls. And as I'll get into later, it's one of the things that the designer keeps playing with the amount. The first games we played, we didn't bother fighting because we just bought the scrolls with gold because they were way too cheap. But that rule has already changed. So once they figure out a good balance for scrolls and the fact that maybe you can only buy one around, that may make it so combat becomes pretty common. Right. Again, reminder, this game isn't quite finished yet. Now, after generating resources, you spend them. Uh, this is pretty typical of any of these games where you collect stuff and spend it to get stuff. You can buy new soldiers. You can upgrade existing soldiers, improve your farms and cities. You can buy these really powerful ability cards, which feature almost game-breakingly strong special powers. And, well, you can buy scrolls, as I just mentioned. And here, when you're buying scrolls, if there are no scrolls in the supply, you get to steal one for another player. So it doesn't matter what they've taken over. Except if that player has that one city that happened to have the scroll tile on it, and then they can't take it unless you kill their city. Again, that part's a little, the one really fiddly bit of this game. Now, when paying for these improvements, if you have a caravan within resource collection distance or one of your soldiers on it, you can trade resources one to the one with the bank for each caravan that you control. And a, and a caravan is a feature on the board, correct? Not yes. a mobile game element. Yeah, it's it's it looks like a camel, and they're on on the board. There's so many out every game. Now, once done spending resources, you then collect any treasure. All over the board are little treasure chests. Like resources, they're collected by having a city within range or having a soldier on. There are 24 different treasures in the game, and they're split between positive and negative effects. Now, when you collect a treasure, you have to roll a die to see if it affects you or your opponents, which I thought was a really strange rule. Now, if you do happen to draw a negative effect and it's affecting you, you do get to ignore it. Now, these treasures do all kinds of things like upgrading soldiers in plays, upgrading or downgrading cities, letting you or your opponents move soldiers, gaining free resources, gaining a scroll, and so on. Because they also have negative and positive effects and may affect your opponent, if you can collect a treasure, you must. So it doesn't really sound like something you want to skip, even if it might benefit your opponent, as the odds of doing nothing or benefiting you directly uh, or by hurting an opponent seem to be in your favor overall? I have mixed thoughts on this one. For the number of games we played, like, like the benefits here can be huge and really swing a game. There is one where it's like, if I roll all my opponents, I'm playing a four-player game and I draw the treasure and it's upgrade three soldiers, three levels, and it affects all my opponents, I'm probably out of that game. So it just, it really depends on your play style too, because it's random, right? Deanna hates these. She hates the treasures because she's all about player agency and being a master of her own destiny and planning ahead. So she avoids the treasure. My girls, on the other hand, wanted as many as they could get because they love the chaos and how everything got messed up every turn by them. Right. And I don't know, I, I, I found them to be a little risky. So I started to stay away from them. My first games, I grabbed them. My later games, I'm like, no, let other people play with the treasure. Really starting Especially if you're playing more than one person. So really starting to notice the theme with your kids. I think maybe leaving the realms of chaos around in their rooms when they were leaning to learning to read worked after all. <laughs> yeah, possibly. <laughs> Definitely my youngest. My youngest likes the chaos in the game. So once you've spent your resources, revealed any treasure, you're gonna roll the dice. Now we turn this into a roll and move game. If you roll a double, something special happens. This could be moving the angel of retribution or gog or gaining one of those ability cards I mentioned. Now, you want to unleash the Angel of Retribution on your opponents. Anyone city being visited by the Angel is too busy dealing with it and can't collect resources. 
On the opposite side, you want Gog to visit your cities. If you manage to do that, you immediately get a full amount of resources, stock up to your max, and then your city is actually protected from the Angel of Retribution, and enemies attacking need to be twice the level to take out your city. All right, so Gog good, Angel bad. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, this is based on the old... Testament. These aren't cute winged cherub angels. This is uh, looks more like a mountain than anything else. Now, after dealing with doubles, you're going to use your dice to move your troops. Total rolls can be split up any way you want over any number of soldiers. So lots of options here. The only real limitation on movement is that you can't cross over water unless your soldiers are at least level three, with a weird special exception expansion. If uh, sorry, exception if you haven't founded all your cities yet. After you move a soldier. You do have an option to found a city. So once you put a soldier out, you get him to a spot you like, you can then throw it away. Um, if you don't have three on the board, you only get three cities total. To found a city, you just replace the soldier with a larger city die, which is set to level one. No, no matter what level the soldier was. So if you... Cid yep, sorry. Yep. Cities are required to start generating resources. So that's vital. You want to get your first city out as early as possible in the game because that's your ability to build up your forces and win the game. Right, and so you want to carefully balance city placement so you're not overlapping acquisition areas at higher levels, I'm assuming? Or can you double down on a resource possible? All right, so I, I went for the simple overview for, for the, the um, podcast here, but I will explain some of the city placement rules a bit more. So cities have to be placed at least two squares away from another city, more than two. There has to be at least two squares between your cities, both yours and your opponent's. Now, each resource can only be collected by a single player once a turn. So overlapping resources with your own cities is bad, but overlapping resources with an opponent just means you both get to collect it. Now, you can deny a city its resources, which is one of the mean things you could do by putting one of your soldiers on the resource. Then you collect it and they don't. Right. So a good bit of strategy and thought process into that beyond just get good stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, battles occur by moving one of your soldiers onto an opponent's. Soldiers are the same level. It's just a D6 roll. Whoever rolls higher defeats the other and gets the spot. More interestingly, if you're not tied, though, the higher level soldier wins the fight, but is reduced in level by the level of the lower soldier. So a level five attacks a level three, the level three is removed, and level five gets knocked down to a level two. So familiar enough to players of small world. Yeah. Now you can also attack cities. Uh, this requires that you siege the city by surrounding it with at least three troops and they have to be of a level equal to or greater than the city's level. When a city's conquered, instead of losing ranks, the attacking soldiers actually level up, and you gain one of those five scrolls. Now, in addition to these combat rules, there are a couple spots in the map that modify combat. Soldiers that are standing on ruins count as one level higher, and there are two volcanoes on the board, and anyone in the volcano can't be attacked at all. I don't quite get the thematic rev reason for that, but whatever, that's the rule. Now, once a specific soldier has fought, you can't move further, so you can't steamroll. You can't, like, use a six to take out a four and then take out a one. Once you've attacked once, you're done, you got to stop. Now, once movement's completed, player passes to the next player in clockwork order, and you just keep going around until someone completes one of the three video, con or video victory conditions. And there we have it, the Battle of Gog. Now, I first saw Battle of Gog on the excellent Brains on Games YouTube channel. Uh, from friend of the show and fellow Canadian podcaster, Brian McDonald. Now, the main things that stood out to me watching his uh, preview of the game was how the map was built, how the deterministic combat system was about the ranks being reduced, and how resource generation worked. Those were the aspects of the game I was most interested in trying myself. And in regards to those three aspects, I was not disappointed in GOG at all. I think the way GOG uses the back of the box to build the map is rather brilliant. Not only does the box design hold the tiles in place, but it, more importantly, it provides a grid so you know where to place the tiles. It's something you need because you can place tiles anywhere. This just wouldn't work if you were just playing on your normal game table. Without the box, you'd still need some kind of play mat or something. And then once you get into a play mat, you got to worry about tile shifting. So actually, the box thing is really brilliant. Yeah, so this is in part because the 6x6 six six grid size of the map makes it possible but not easy to lay out, a, uh, lay out this map without those grid lines in place. Yeah, yeah and like you'd want a non-stick mat or non-slip mat or something. It, it really does work. Now, once the map's done, it felt like I'm playing Civ 2 on my Amiga at this point. Like it just, 
the, just the look of the map. And then that was reinforced by the way the cities work, right? When you go to your city view in Civ 2 and you get to see the resources around your city and how much food and population you generate. I just got that feel from this. So I liked it. I, and the fact that when you level up your city, you get to a wider circle. I thought that was neat. Now, what was strange, though, is there are only three resources in the game, which just seemed odd to me because there were so many different icons that all meant food, which I, I guess it was done to keep it simple. And I almost wonder if the game was more complex originally and he reduced it so that the different types of foods didn't matter. But like, there aren't multiple types of mines for gold and there aren't multiple um, woods. Like there's just forest or forest. There's nothing else. Right. So I got a Minecraft feel from the map tiles, actually. But yeah. you're right. It's weird to have those multiple icons for a single resource type. Yeah. So another thing that felt odd is only being able to have, hold five resources. And it wasn't based on how many cities you had. And when we first played, it was a rush to find spots that will gather everything. Like this city is going to get two wood and three food and also this and this. Well, you do want to do this to some extent, be able to collect more than what you can hold is a waste. The max you can get up to is a farm size of seven. So you can only have seven of each resource type. And the same thing for using your soldiers. So like at first, I'm like, I'm going to get the city with all this stuff. And then I'm going to move my soldiers onto resources. And then I'm going to get all this stuff. And I'm not. I think you have a hard limit on how much you can hold. But this also folds into how important it is to up that limit, right? You probably want to get a farm out pretty early, up to the sixth level at least. So I got to say, our last gameplay, no one upgraded their farm. So early games, we were using it all the time. Later games, we, well, to be honest, more crowded board was harder to get resources, so we didn't need them. Right. So pacing is really kind of the key. You want the right amount of resources coming in for your farms mm -hmm. and balancing it all out. Now, using resources just feels right. Um, so I do look forward to when the game has some more development done and the costs are locked down instead of changing. It feels like every time I play, because uh, this is the aspect of the game. The designer has been playing with the most right now and actually like writing me and saying, Hey, try scrolls costing this much, or Hey, try making upgrading your farms cost three of each resource instead of two. Like this has happened quite a bit. And the cost of buying scrolls has literally changed every time we played the game. Like, I, I have suggested things to him, like, why not make it cost six? Because then you'd have to upgrade your farm before buying scrolls, and no one could do it early in the game. And then we found a card combo where you can use any resources, anything, and someone could potentially buy four scrolls in one turn. I'm like, that doesn't seem right. So this is in flux a lot right now. Right. E economies are hard, and often the ruination of a game when not yeah, our first game, the scrolls only cost two gold each. And it was that the whole game was just, I buy scroll, you buy scroll, I buy scroll, you buy scroll. And all we bothered collecting was gold. We didn't even worry about soldiers and fighting. So right. this is, it, it's definitely, like, it feels right, but it just needs balance. Now, the resource generation spending made me feel like Catan. Like, I sit there every turn, and I look, and I go, okay, how much wood do I get? Okay, how much of the food do I get? Okay, how do I get that? And then I grab the, 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 the chart that comes in the game and go, okay, what can I buy with this? I got three food. What can I get for three food? That felt very Catan-like to me. Now, the other game that comes to mind whenever I'm playing Battle of Gog is Small World, that Sean mentioned earlier, and that's due to that deterministic battle system. I love that really simple system. I love that. It, it just makes sense. Higher level unit wins, and then is reduced by the level of the lower unit. And, and I love that. I like the lack of randomness, especially when there's so much more randomness in other aspects of this game. As we've talked about quite recently, randomness is fine with the right levels of mitigation. Yeah. And, and to be honest, that randomness is my biggest problem with Battle of Guck. This game is extremely random with so many in-game elements rewarding high rolls with no real catch-up mechanic or, or bonus for ruling badly. Like, this becomes evident right from the first turn of the game where all players are scrambling to send those three soldiers out and to claim sections of the board and found their city. A player rolling low here is going to be at a disadvantage that could potentially last the entire game. Similarly, rolling low even later in the game can greatly impact your ability to move your troops where they need to be, either to attack, defend, or even just to collect resources. Then there's bonuses. If you get lucky enough to roll doubles, you also get to move Gog or the Angel or gain one of those ability cards. So it's just like, it just comes up now and then, and all of a sudden you get this thing. And like I said before, these ability cards are extremely powerful. They include things like being able to move over any amount of water for one move, getting five extra movement every turn, gaining three free resources of your choice every turn, or being able to use any resource to pay any cost and more. 
And then there's that treasure chest system I was talking about before. Not only is it a 24 card deck, so it's random what you get and what it's going to do, but you also have to roll another die to see if it happens to you or everyone else. And often it gives an advantage to your opponents, even though like you're the one that collected the treasure. It just feels off. It feels like if I collect the treasure, I should get the thing. Yeah, and, and the randomness from even before the game starts with the random layout of the board. Well, I guess that it is a random layout of the board, but the players are the ones putting it out. So at least there's some agency there. Right. You do kind of get to control your own fate. Now, while randomness can be good for games, right? One of the things it does is keeps things interesting. And it makes it so the game's infinitely replayable. Because you're probably going to be on a different map every time. There's a 36 different map tiles. I don't know what six to the power of 36 is, but that's your number of possible different maps. Or sorry, it'd be six to the power of 36 to the power of 34 to the power of 35 or whatever it is, or six to the power the, the whatever math. There's <laughs> lots of possible combinations. Um, so I get that. And it also, and this is something I think that was done to make it feel like a family game. And this is something game designers have been doing for years. And the reason some people think that free parking is fun in Monopoly is that it makes it fun for players of different skill levels. That no matter how bad you're playing, you might get that lucky roll to get that thing that still lets you win. I personally and most of our family found the randomness to be a step above what we usually look for. Like it's so high that it interferes with your ability to plan ahead, which in a war game is an issue. Yeah, well, it might not be an issue for all players. Uh, the more towards a hardcore hobby gamer you become, the more adverse to randomness you you get. And as you want that strategic planning, that's your skill in strategic planning is what's making some of yeah. these hobby games fun for you. Now, I do want to mention a couple things before I get into final thoughts. So one is Battle of Gog is a biblically themed game. This is based on the story of Gog and Magog from chapter 38 of the book of Ezekiel. This is a pair that also comes up much later in very different roles in the book of Revelation to John. What I think is important here, though, is that the game uses the story of Gog as a theme and only as a theme. I actually appreciate the fact the game doesn't do any evangelizing at all. Like there's no preaching going on. And to be honest, it doesn't even mention anywhere that this is based on a biblical story. It's not even like you get a Bible reference. Though I do worry the biblical theme might scare people away. They're like, oh, it's a it's a biblical game. I don't think there's any reason this should scare anyone away. Yeah, the, the vast majority of Gog um, mythology seems to actually primarily be in ap apocalyptic, prophetic, non-biblical texts. Mm. Uh, the Bible itself actually has very little mention of Gog and describes Magog as a place in the Old Testament, but a person in the New. So the biblical associations shouldn't really attract or scare you from this project. They're just addressing used for an interesting game. The final aspect of Battle of Gog I want to talk about again before final thoughts is player count. So the game's listed as two to four players. And yes, it works. You can play the game as written at all those player counts. We just found it didn't work very well with two players. Now, one problem being the map's too big. Like you're looking at 36 square tiles and you can take over anywhere. You're not fighting over territory. You can found a city in nice, happy spots. And the other problem with two players, though, is once one player got ahead, there wasn't really anything to slow them down. Where with more players, alliances can be made. Not necessarily handshake alliances, but just gang up on the leader, right? This one player is doing too well. So anyone gaining an early lead can be held back by the other players. With the full player count of four, there isn't enough space on the board for everyone to have happy cities that collect lots of stuff every turn. With four, you'll be lucky if you can get one really good resource generating cities with your other two maybe grabbing one or two resources every turn and that's it due to just space on the board. And moving soldiers onto opponents' resources becomes more important. Where in a two-player game, well, if you're stopping me from collecting wood here, I'll just go get it over there. And then you end up with really neat situations. Like in our last game, I was in the position to take out one of Gigi's cities. And if I did that, I would get a scroll. But it opened up the possibility for Grace to take out her last city on the other side of the board. And then she was in the same position with me. If she took out that city, I could get the other one. So it ended up Gigi's perfectly safe. She's in this position where if either of us attack our cities, it gives the game to each other. So it let her build up, which I thought was a really fun aspect of the game. So I can't recommend this game at two, the way it is written now. Now, again, this game's still in process. And I did send a suggestion to the designer 
that remove the game, remove a row from the top side, play five by five or four by four playing with playing with two players. That I think would work, though that's not official and it is something they're going to prob- possibly check as a stretch goal in the Kickstarter because he seems to want to then provide a smaller board, which I don't think is necessary. I think you could just remove the corners and it'd still work. You wouldn't have to worry about stuff shifting, but to each own. So it's too big for a two player. And is it too small for a four player or did that scarcity really work out well? No, no, it's like perfect for a four player. It's, yeah. it's that you can't get everything you want. So you're going to have to settle, which I think works for a war game. You know what? This is the whole thing with two player. You don't want a war game where there's nothing to compete over. It's like, I got my three cities. You've got your three cities. And it goes back to the thing we were talking about where, well, you're just going to try to buy the scrolls before me. And I'm not going to bother attacking you because I got to take out all three of your cities. It's just not going to happen. Right. Now, I do say this is how the game is now, right? I mentioned this before. And, and, and the overall feeling I got from this game is that it's not finished, which it's not. Fair enough, right? I said that right at the top. Unlike some games that launch on Kickstarter, fully finished with finalized rules and components, this is still a work in progress. And it's something I had to keep reminding myself, right? I had to keep this in mind when playing the game and talking about the game and sharing stuff on Instagram and reviewing it here. This game is still in the middle of the development and playtesting phase. And to be honest, the designer has admitted it. This hasn't been sent to an editor yet, which is why I didn't mention the layout, spelling, and grammatical issues and rule omissions because I know the game's not done. Now, taking that fact into account, it's not finished, it's not polished. We did have a lot of fun playing Battle of Gods. Like, the, as I mentioned at the top of this, the the aspects of the game I expected to like, I like. The way battles represented, the abstract tiles, the use of dice to represent armies, cities, works really well. I love the deterministic combat system that uses dice to create effects. And while I wish the resource collection and spending system had a little bit more variety and there was a little bit more than three resources, I get it because he was trying to do a simple family weight game. There's honestly a lot to like in Battle of Gods. Now, my family is somewhat split on their opinion. My oldest daughter loved it. My youngest felt there were too many things you had to think about at once. And Deanna and I both thought it was solid, but just isn't quite there. There's just not enough there for us to love it. It didn't wow us. We had fun playing with it. It just feels like it needs something more. And I hope that gets added. I hope with future development and playtesting, the game gets that added boost it seems to need. So I would also like to note that the schedule laid out on the Kickstarter seems a bit accelerated. So while I have no reason to doubt the determination to fulfill should the game hit its goal, I do have concerns about their ability to fulfill in the allotted time. Mm. Though if they have their distribution channels locked in, I would be happy to be proven wrong. Yeah, it's a Kickstarter. Do do your due diligence, buyer beware, all the usual stuff with the Kickstarter. I will note this is their first project, so it's not like they have experience having published games before. Battle of Gog is a pretty simple, I would almost say gateway level abstract war game that has a good chance of appealing, appealing to fans of light folk on a map game, especially folk on a map games that include things like founding cities and gathering resources. This game reminds me of like a mashup of Civilization, like Civ 2, the old Civ, Civ 2, Catan, and Small World. And I think fans of those games may find things they will like in GOG. There's a lot I liked, and I think it's worth giving a shot if you're into white abstract war games. While I personally found the randomness to be a little too high for my taste, I'm certain that'll actually be an advantage to other groups. We'll see that as a, a benefit. Most of all, again, What I played wasn't finished, so I can only assume that the final version will be even better than the game we've been playing the last few weeks. And that's it for our look at the Battle of Gog. You can read more about this game over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Well, not a ton of gaming this last week. Um, Most of it's been playing Battle of Gog in prep for the review tonight, which I got to say was not easy to do, uh, to pre-write and put on the blog or anything. It's just hard to give my final thoughts on a game that's not finished. How can I have final thoughts? Honestly, every time we sat down to play, there's been one or more rule questions or issues. And every time I send it to the designer, and he's been awesome about it, he's gotten back to us, which is great. But every time he's done that, he's changed something. So while I get it, the game's not done, But, like, these changes have been pretty drastic. Like, 
why not try paying three of each resource for a scroll? Like literally just like like spitballing, right? Or you know what? You don't need the exact number of a city to take it over. It just has to be one or above, that or above, which actually I just say makes sense. And scrolls flying back and forth and buying back and forth too quick. How about you try five gold next game? Like it's just, like it's been frustrating, honestly. Like I was lent a copy of this game to review, not to play test. Yeah, and this is a concern. And I have to say, honestly, something I suspect a lot more established previewers wouldn't put up with. Yeah. Uh, a busy reviewer trying to do five or more games a week doesn't have time to fight with a game that either works as it's written or it doesn't. Yeah, I'll admit I was tempted to review it that way. And in the sorry, first time we played, it was kind of broken and we bought scrolls and like the whole, I didn't get to see the combat system and I didn't draw a single ability card and engaging with your game. We just tried to collect the most gold that was laying. Like, I could have ended there. Thankfully, well, I don't know. Thankfully, I did reach out, and I did get real clarification. The game has improved, in my opinion, because of that. So I guess I helped. Anyway, I, I will be more being more discerning in my choice of what to review in the future, just trying to confirm, are the rules finalized? Is probably a question I will be adding to my acceptance for doing this. Now, moving away from GOG, enough GOG, no more GOG, shut the Bible. The other thing Deanna and I got to the table is the new updated second edition of World's Fair 1893 from Renegade Games. Uh, this was our first time playing the new version, and it's the same. It's nothing changed. Um, I actually opened up my old copy of the game and compared it side by side. And except for new box art, a new discussion on racism in the rulebook, and five more diverse historical figures, there's nothing new about this from the old. Like, gameplay was identical. And that's not a bad thing, but I think people need to realize that there wasn't a huge change to the second edition. If a game is good, there's no reason to fix it. You don't, you don't yeah. brick a, you don't, you don't fix a working clock. So that's it. What you get in this box is five new cards. That's the only actual change, which I appreciate the addition of diversity in the game. I have no problem with that. I'm not trying to, to rag on Renegade for that, but it's just not a step up from the old game in any other way. Now, one of the things this did remind me is, man, World's Fair in 1893 is good. Like, this is a really good game. It's a simple to teach and interesting mix of set collection and area majority with a really cool card drafting mechanic about putting, putting cards out around a Ferris wheel. Like, playing the Saturday night was just like, huh, we might have to throw this on the Sean needs to play it list. Like, and I got to get my kids playing. I, this, this is a solid game. I, now, I do owe Renegade a full review. They did send me a review copy of this. So that's all I'm going to say now. But... I'm expecting we'll have that review pretty soon. Now, the final game that got played this last week was Sunday, where Deanna, Sean, and I sat down with tabletop bellhop patron Courtney, uh, who you may recognize from the Ask the Bellhop segment earlier. And we taught him how to play Aventuria on Tabletop Simulator, which I'm pleased to say, I, I actually felt proficient using Tabletop Simulator this week. Like, like, if I wanted to do a thing, most of the time I did that thing. Now, this may be, I've just learned how to play Aventuri on Tabletop Simulator. I have no idea if I'm actually growing my virtual tabletop skills, if this will port to other games. But I got to say, I, I got to that flow where like, where the, in, the, the interface kind of got out of the way and I got to enjoy the game more. And that made it more enjoyable than the last couple plays. Yeah, I completely agree. I felt almost comfortable moving around and I only flipped over my entire deck by accident once or twice. Yeah, that still happened. <laughs> that one did still happen. Yeah. Now, during our game, I did skip over the dual roles, and we jumped right into the first short adventure, Saving Sylvana. I think it went really well. Like, it, it seemed to go over extremely well. Sean and I played. We each picked a character and played. Deanna, who hates Tabletop Simulator with a passion, just played narrator, doing the reading from the adventure book and telling us what the baddies were doing on their turn. And that, that actual system worked out pretty well. Yeah, the flow was really nice, and it played smoothly. Uh, not quite as smoothly as in a group at a table would no. have, but when that's not an option, Tabletop Simulator is a growing option on for me. Yeah, I got to say, I'm, I'm like, man, I should have probably got into this at the start of the pandemic. How many <laughs> games could we have actually gotten played? Uh, I'm still not going to review stuff on Tabletop Simulator. Sorry, publishers, I, won't, I need physical games. Won't be doing that, but I may be playing some more games on this. And I guess, hey, Courtney seemed to have a good time. I was hoping he'd be in the chat tonight to confirm that. But that was the point, right? Like, this is a patron reward. We sat down with one of our patrons, had a good night gaming together. Would have been awesome if Evil John could have joined us because I really think he's going to like it, especially our uh, Evil John's RPG and D&D &D background. I think he would have really liked it. So 
I, I am definitely more open to the idea of playing on Tabletop Simulator. And for me, it's been playing a bunch of Blood Bowl, both uh, 2 and 3, to compare and explore what the game had to offer. Now, I do have another one I have been playing, but I can't talk about it until Tuesday. But we'll just mention Richard Garfield and Deck Building. And I don't know what's up with them saying publish a review when I already published one, but they, they want a new one. I don't even know. But something new is coming, and I will say it's gotten better. And uh, it'll release on the th- next Thursday. So a week from today, that game will actually release it. There you go. That, that, that one will be officially out. I, and it's better. That's, that's all I will say without saying the name of the game. Although, I, if you're listening to this, you can hear the name of the game, which, I don't know, maybe Sean can add in and, and, and edit <laughs> what game I'm talking about. I hate embargoes. There. Here, here's my final. Why? Why not let me talk this up? Why can't I get my people excited? My people. Now I feel like an overlord <laughs> or something. Our fans. Why oh. can't I get our fans excited about this? It's an awesome thing. It's a lot of fun, and it got better, and I can't tell you, which is dumb. All right, well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Well, I plan to use a whole bunch of ink. Now that I'm done with GOG, I'll be mailing that off to another Canadian reviewer. Actually, I don't know if it'll be a Canadian, because I thought it came from a Canadian, but when I looked up the other day, we were talking about shipping rates. It ends up it came from the U.S. So I am supposed to forward that on. Um, no, not at my cost, at their cost. So I want to get that out of here. Like, not in a bad way, like, in a get it done with, it's done, go. So Big G is going to be disappointed. She actually really liked it. So my big plans for the week, Forest of No Return for Aventuria. We got to do that. We, we got to get, we, we stalled out on Aventuria and I feel bad. We keep planning to play it and something's come up and we haven't gotten into it. So we're going to try the first official adventure, like not starter set, not demo. This is the first big box adventure. We're going to try out the Alchemist. Uh, D and I are going to fight over who gets to play him, but he's wearing green. So I think she's going to win. Um, we're probably going to do that with some fondue, which, you know what, we're breaking our own rules. We're going to have fondue on the same table as a board game. Oh, that sounds terrible. Yeah, We've got episodes saying not to do that. We have episodes saying not to do that. Maybe we'll build a wall. Yes, don't dip the Aventuria cards. All oh, with a legacy game. No, totally <laughs> different. So, yeah, I, I'm planning on that. The other one was after playing World's Fair, I'm like, my kids could play this, like, easily. World's Fair, oh, it's, it's a thinky filler. It's like under an hour. There's so much great stuff going on. If you like Seven Wonders, you would love this game because it's better, in my opinion. And you have similar things like trying to collect the tech trees. So I'm thinking my kids will dig that. So I want to do that. Now, while it's not going to happen this week, I, I, based on the way things are going, it looks like we might be able to meet up with immediate family soon. So what that is going to do is make me hold off on a couple of games. Um, again, Aroma, uh, Guildmaster, Trap Words. Guildmaster, I was actually planning on sitting down this week with Deanna and playing two-player. I'm going to hold off because it, 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 there's a take that element and there's an auction and those just don't work good three players. And I don't think I can give it a fair sheet with two. So we're going to put Guildmaster to the back of the pile. But what I do want to pull out again is Unfair. And I think it'll be interesting to play Unfair and World's Fair just because there's similar themes in a way. Um, other than that, pfft, who knows? <laughs> really? And, and even what I just said is subject to change. And we may even actually be able to do some unfair on tabletop. So tabletop simulator. So I mean, you know, we may actually. Yeah, we looked that up. We need so. we need to figure out if we actually can do that. Yeah. All right. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark, joining the Misdirected Mark team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch. Joe Swick. I've been interacting with Joe a lot on social media recently. Thanks, Joe. Evil John, missed you on Sunday. Hope things have improved since then. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com can find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like what we've been doing here tonight and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhops at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for brunch. 
for Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game, game on. on.